I'm someone who likes to walk, so I'm going to step out from behind the podium. How are we all today? Good? Uh, whose first event post-COVID is this, out of interest? There's still quite a lot of you. Welcome back. We're here in person. I've got a lower half. You can see me. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking to you about some of the drivers of sustainability today for businesses, specifically. Why is this so important? And not just because of the environment, not just because of the situation we're in. Um, and, you know, Bim was talking about sticks and carrots. Um, out of interest, who would like to hear more about sticks to beat you with today? No? Uh, who would like to hear more about carrots? Oh, I thought so. Okay. Well, we'll cover a little bit of both. We'll start off with um, some sticks and then we'll get to more carrots. Um, so, this is, uh, so I work at Planet Mark. Uh, we're a sustainability certification. So we support organizations with carbon reduction, the creation of social value, um, and measuring. So it's all about reductions. Um, and our members, we, we certify hundreds of organizations from the Eden Project right the way up to sort of Volvo UK. So uh, our members in 2019, pre-COVID, this is sort of your first um, proof that this is absolutely possible for you to take action for it to be significant. 2019, pre-COVID, our members reduced their absolute carbon footprint on average by 12%. In 2020, COVID stat, that was 24.5%. <laughs> so you absolutely can do this. I want to start by framing it that way. This is absolutely possible for you to take action on your carbon footprint and on social value. So... Stick. I've got to give you a bit of stick first. I'm not going to give you too much on this because hopefully you're pretty persuaded at this point. But um, the we know that this is something we have to do. Um, and people may not be aware, um, the IPCC, the Interna uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released a new report on Monday this week. And it's been kind of drowned out in the news for understandable reasons. Um, but the IPCC report for the first time has given us a metric on what proportion of the human population lives within a high-risk area where they are likely to need to move because of drought or flood or some other form of, of extreme weather condition? And the answer to that question is half of the human population. 3.3 billion people. So we absolutely have to get on top of this. This is a survival issue. It's not about saving the planet. This is about us. This is about the, the planet's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Plan's going to be absolutely fine. This is about human beings. So, how does this matter for business? Here's some carrots for you. So, HSBC did uh, a survey of over 10,000 of their business customers in 2020. And this is the expectations of those businesses. They expect 86% of companies expected their sales to grow in the coming year as a result of becoming more sustainable. 86%. And you know how sort of we, we tend to make self-fulfilling prophecies when people expect something to happen? It often does. <laughs> so people expect to grow as a result of sustainability. But it goes beyond the bottom line. It's not just about the finances. People expect it to boost employee well-being. They expect to get greater talent recruitment. They expect to attract greater investment. And they expect to enhance their reputations. We've already heard about how people really care about this now. And it's not just young people. Um, and I can prove that now. Everyone cares. It is not just young people. This is a survey of 1.2 million people at the beginning of last year, right? January 2021. And you can see here, they did it across 50 countries, 1.2 million people. And look at those age, look at the differences, right? 14 to 18 year olds are the highest with 69% of them saying that climate change is a global emergency. But the lowest it gets is about 50, 58, 60% with a 60 plus. Everyone cares. Don't believe this is just about young people. It is everywhere now. Young people are merely the canary in the coal mine, as they always are. Can, young people are just the first sign of cultural shift because they're growing up into the culture that is arriving, not the one that we are moving away from. So they just, they're a sign of the times and where it's going. We've seen it with technology, and we're seeing it now with sustainability. They are a, a very useful bellwether in knowing where business is likely to go. So, big carrots. It just makes business sense. A lot of what makes a business more sustainable, you don't actually have to use the word sustainability to justify it. <laughs> Would you like to reduce your energy bills? Yes. Would you like to re reduce your cost of waste? Yes. 
would you like to use some of that waste as a resource so that you don't have to buy as many materials? Yes. You know, these things just make good business sense. And as was said already before by BIM, a lot of these things, actually ju just doing them because they make sense for your business, you don't necessarily have to be doing them because you believe fervently in, in a higher purpose. I would hope you would want that too, but you don't have to. It, it does just make business sense. So I'm going to give you some examples of how fast things are moving. So this is an example of how regulation changes. Actually, business is moving faster. So, for example, in transport, uh, you may be familiar with the fact that by 2030, no new petrol and diesel vehicles will be sold. By 2035, no new hybrids. And then in COP26, they announced the new deadline of 2040 for all heavy goods vehicles. All of your no, no new heavy goods vehicles, diesel or petrol, will be sold as of 2040. However, we uh, did a whole tour last year, the Zero Carbon Tour. We were on the road for three and a half months. In an, uh, they, the first bus you saw was a big electric bus, fully electric bus. We went all over the UK in an electric bus. Think that was possible? <laughs> it was. Uh, we, didn't have to we didn't run out of juice. We came very close in some places, I won't lie to you. Um, but we made it all the way around. And then that is a double-decker hydrogen bus in Northern Ireland. We travel all over in one of those there. Now, we chatted to the makers of that bus. Did you know that most London buses are made in Northern Ireland? I didn't. <laughs> and now, so it's made by a company called the Right Bus Company. When you see that logo on the front of a bus, London bus, now you know where it's from. Now, last year, 30% of their production was zero emission transport, either electric or hydrogen buses, 30% already. But what's kind of exciting is we asked them, so what, what about this year? What's, what's your forecasts? 70%. <laughs> Woo, that's a fast move. Why is that, right? Now, we chatted to TransLink, who are the public transport provider in Northern Ireland. Their, their CEO, Chris Conway, told us, well, yeah, that makes sense to me because this is the last year I think I'll ever put in an order for a diesel bus. Why is that? Well, because a bus is an asset that depreciates over a 15-year period. And we anticipate that the cost of fuel, the cost of polluting, the cost of carbon will be such that in 10 years' time, the value metrics on these assets have already flipped. It might be a higher upfront capital cost for us now, but in 10 years' time, it's not going to make any financial sense for us to be holding on to these assets. So things are moving, 2040, but already 70% of their production, and already TransLink are saying, yeah, we're, we're stopping ordering pretty much now. So things are moving faster than regulation even requires. And you can think about, what about the bus companies who haven't seen this opportunity coming? The ones who are steadfastly producing their petrol and diesel buses and don't see that their competitors are swallowing up an entire new market and gaining reputation there. So that's an example of quite a big industry. Not everyone's going to be in public transport, whatever. But how is this going to affect everyone else? So uh, Rishi Sunak announced at COP26 there is a 2023 deadline for all London Stock Exchange listed businesses and financial institutions in the UK to have a net zero strategy. Now, how does that affect you? Well, because you may not be a business that's listed on the London Stock Exchange, but do you work with one? Or do you work with someone who works with one? Or do you work with someone who works with someone who works with one? If you do, you're in their supply chain. And net zero encompasses scope three emissions. I don't have time today to go into this. You're going to hear more about measuring from some of the uh, people later on. But broadly speaking, if you're in someone's supply chain and they have a net zero responsibility, they are coming for your data. And I'll share an example with that with you in a minute. But here are a couple. So Microsoft and Salesforce, they have embedded into every single supplier contract, you must have a net zero strategy within the next two years or you're gone. We will not buy from you anymore. Microsoft put in a carbon price as things move around within their supply chain, which allowed them to ring fence billions of dollars to spend on their carbon uh, adaptation measures. So watch out for that, because this is a trickle-down effect. It's a wave of responsibility that's going to cascade through the supply chain, and it's already happening. And here's one example. 24th of September last year, a bunch of our members received this email from Tesco's. And Tesco's had four demands for their, their suppliers. Number one, disclose your carbon emissions to us by the end of the year. Three months notice. Thanks for that. 
We need you to set a net zero target by the end of 2022. It needs to be a science-based target with a 50% reduction and how you're going to do that by the end of 2023. And you need to switch to renewable energy now if you haven't done so already. Right? Imagine receiving that email from your biggest customer, one who may well be one of your halo brands, one of the ones you always talk about to other customers. Oh, yeah, I work with Tesco's. Yeah. Imagine receiving that email. Do you want to receive that email and go, ha, great, <laughs> here you go. There's our carbon footprint. There's our net zero strategy. We're done. Th thank you. Oh, and by the way, with the suppliers of yours that you end up dropping because they don't move fast enough, we might be able to support you with some of their business that you can't cover anymore. Risk and opportunity, they're two sides of the same coin. If you're on the right side of this, you can swallow up whole new portions of business and opportunity. If you're on the wrong side of it, you will be dropped. That's you know, Within the next 12 months, one of your biggest customers is coming for your data. And what does that mean? So I'm not going to go too long on this because I don't have long enough, but net zero is the goal that we're working towards. That's the, that's the crux of the issue here. Carbon neutral is nice. It's a nice thing. But it's, 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 unless it's part of a wider net zero strategy, you are missing the point and you are not ready for what's coming. Because net zero requires 90% plus reductions in carbon footprint. Carbon neutral does not. And the measurement requirements are very different. So if you'd like to understand more about that, come and talk to me um, or my colleague uh, Kit, who's up at the back there. Um, and we also run CPD accredited net zero carbon essentials workshops. There's one coming up on the 24th of March where you can come and you can really get to grips with what net zero means for you and your business and get equipped with all the tools you need to deal with it. So this is all part, we're a partner of the Race to Zero campaign as our CBN experts who are here as well. So what this means is this is what a good net zero target looks like. You've got to pledge at a head of organization level. You can't slip it past your CEO. You've got to tell them about it that you will reach net zero as soon as possible before 2050. Within 12 months of making your pledge today, you can make your pledge today, within 12 months of now, you have to set an interim target representing at least a 50% reduction by 2030 and how you're gonna do that. You have to take immediate action. You can't kick it down the road a few years. You've got to be taking action on your carbon footprint now and then you've got to be publishing. Report your progress in the public domain on an annual basis. So I'll, I'll finish with a call to action from uh, Sir David Attenborough because it's not a sustainability talk without it. So uh, this is what David had to say about uh, this year that we're in now. It's a crucial moment in our history. This could be a year for positive change for ourselves, for our planet, and for the wonderful creatures with which we share it. A year the world could remember proudly and say, we made a difference. And so our call to action for you today is to be a part of making that difference because it makes sense for you to do so. <laughs> and so uh, by all means, come and say hello if you'd like to learn more about uh, the Planet Mark community, come and chat. And then the Net Zero Carbon Essentials Workshop, if you go to planetmark.com forward slash events, you can find all of the upcoming workshops where you can go and really get to grips with the, the nitty gritty stuff that I can't necessarily cover in 15 minutes. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'll pass it back to Ian. <laughs>